This is a Puritan and Reformed audiobook podcast. The following author, Robert Bolton, wrote this book, Directions for a Comfortable Walk with God, in the year 1626. Direction 1. Abandon your beloved sin. Look that you live not in any one known sin against your conscience, hating to be reformed. Do not cherish, allow, or go on in any lust, corruption, or lewd way in your heart, life, or calling. Don't allow any work of darkness or service of Satan to reign and domineer in you. For if so, you are so far from ability or possibility of walking with God or delighting in Him, that you wear the devil's brand and are yet most certainly one of his. See and search the true meaning of such places as these. First John 3 verses 3, 6, 8, and 9, James 2, verse 10, Ezekiel 18, verse 21 and 30. Suitable to this is the concurrent judgment and doctrine of our best theologians and worthiest writers, graciously instructed to the kingdom of heaven. These are their several assertions to the same sense in their own words, number one. A man can have no peace in his conscience that favors and retains any one sin in himself against his conscience. Number two, a man is in a damnable state. Whatever good deeds seem to be in him, if he doesn't yield to the work of the Holy Spirit, for the leaving, but of any one known sin, which fights against the peace of his conscience. Number three, So long as the power and mortification destroys your sinful affections, and so long as you are unfeignedly displeased with all sin, and do mortify the deeds of the body by the Spirit, your case is a case of salvation. Number four. A good conscience stands not with the purpose of sinning, no, not with an irresolution against sin. Number five. The rich and precious box of a good conscience is polluted and made impure if but one dead fly be allowed in it. He means any one known sin allowed and delighted in impenitently. Number six. Where there is but any one sin nourished and fostered, all our other graces are not only blemished but abolished. They are no graces. Number seven. Most true is that saying of Aquinas that all sins are coupled together, though not as to seeking the same temporal good, for some look to the good of gain, some of glory, some of pleasure, and so on, yet in regard of aversion from eternal good, that is God, so that he that looks but toward one sin is as much averted and turned back from God as if he looked to all. In which respect, James says, he that offends in one point is guilty of all. Number eight. Every Christian should carry in his heart a constant and resolute purpose not to sin in anything. For faith and the purpose of sinning can never stand together. You see then, if Satan keeps possession but by one reigning sin, it will be your everlasting ruin. You shall then be so far from ever enjoying any humble, holy acquaintance with our God that you are gone, body and soul, forever. One breach in the walls of a city exposes it to the surprise of the enemy. One leak in a ship neglected will sink it at length into the bottom of the sea. The stab of a pen knife to the heart will as well destroy a man as all the daggers that killed Caesar in a senate house. If you hedge your close as high as the middle region of the air and all other places, and leave but one gap, all your grass will be gone. If the fowler catch the bird, either by the head or the foot or the wing, she is surely his own. It is so in the present case. If you live and lie with allowance and delight in any one known sin, without particular remorse or resolution to part with it, you as yet carry the devil's brand. He has thereby marked you out for his own. As obedience is universal and Catholic, if sincere, so repentance, if true, is also general. It strips us stark naked. As a worthy divine says, well, quote, 
of all the garments of the old Adam, and leaves not so much as one rag behind? In this rotten building it leaves not a stone upon a stone? As the flood drowned Noah's own friends and servants, so must a flood of repentant tears drown our sweetest and most profitable sins." The premonition, therefore, I tender in the first place is this. You can never possibly be fitly qualified, either for the right understanding or saving practice of the sacred and sweetest art of walking with God, except you resolve to stand forever sincerely at the sword's point against all sin. Even your bosom sin must be abandoned, if you look for any blessing in this kind. And because this darling pleasure, this minion delight, is Satan's stronghold, his tower of greatest confidence and security, when he is driven out elsewhere, and so consequently is most powerful and peremptory in keeping a man's heart estranged, with largest distance and incompatible aversion from all holy acquaintance with God, I will in short labor to enlighten and disentangle any one who unfeignedly desires an utter divorce from this bosom devil, by telling him one, what it is, two, the marks to discover it, number three, how he may be deceived about it, number one, as in every man there is one element, one humor, and ordinarily one passion predominant, so also one work of darkness and way of death, and it is that which is corrupt and original crookedness upon the first elective survey and prospect over the fool's paradise of worldly pleasures, fleshly lusts, and vanities of this life, by a secret sensual inclination and bewitching infusion of Satan singles out and makes special choice of to follow and feed upon with the greatest delight and predominant sweetness. Afterward, by custom and continuance, grows so powerful and attractive that it extraordinarily endears and draws to it the heat of all his desires and strongest workings of his heart, with much affectionate impatience and headlongness, and at the height, by an irresistible tyranny, it makes all occasions and occurrences, friends and followers, the deepest reach of policy and utmost projects of wit, religion, conscience, credit with the world, the universal possibility of body, soul, outward estate, serviceable and contributory to it, as the captain and commanding sin, as to the devil's viceroy, domineering in the wasted conscience. In some, it is worldliness, wantonness, ambition, opposition to godliness, usury, pride, revenge, or the like. In others, it may be drunkenness, the swaggering vanity of good fellowship, gluttony, pleasures of playhouse haunting, gaming, scurrilous jesting, obstinate insatiableness, and allowed recreations, idleness, or such like. Number two, you may discover it by such marks as these. First, it is that which your truest friends, your own conscience, and the anger of God and the ministry many times find out, meet with, and chiefly check you for. Secondly, it is that which, if it break out into act and be visible to the eye of the world, your enemies most eagerly observe and object as matter of their chief insult and your greatest disgrace. Third, that which you are loath to leave, are oftenest tempted to, you have the least power to resist, and which most hinders a resignation and submission of your soul and body, of all your courses and carriage, heartily and unreservedly to the word and will of God. Number four, it is that which God most often corrects in you, even the interpretation and guilty acknowledgement of your self-accusing heart. It may be, as several times, you have been afflicted with some heavy cross in your outward state, loss of a child, some fits and pangs of bodily pain, tears and troubles of mind, or some such proportionable visitations. Now in all these and like afflictions, upon the first smarting apprehension, your conscience, 
if it is any whit awakened, on its own accord seized upon that sin we now seek for, as the principal Achan and author of all your misery. Fifthly, if ever you were so sick, as out of extremity to receive the sentence of death against yourself, and despair of recovery, if your conscience was stirring, the sin affrighted you most, and gave the deadliest blow to you to final despair. And if you should die in it without repentance, which God forbid, it would infuse most hellish vigor and venom into the never-dying worm, which would by this more mightily gnaw upon your conscience through all eternity. If ever the sword of the Spirit shall cleave it from your bosom, which is infinitely to be desired, and strike through your sensual heart with true repentance, it will cost you the bitterest tears, the most sighs, and the deepest groans. Number six. It is that which you are most loath to have known. If it were possible, you could be well content that no John the Baptist should ever hear of your Herodias. And therefore you beat your brains and improve your wit to devise, if it be capable of daubing, distinctions, evasions, excuses, extenuations, whole cartloads of fig leaves, to color and cloak this foul fin, though favorite to your bewitched soul. Seventhly, that which you are in a bodily fear to minister will meddle and meet with when you are going to a faithful and searching sermon. For you think with yourself, if this day he disclose my bosom, I shall both be disgraced amongst my neighbors that know it, and cast also into melancholy by his denouncing of terror against it. 8. Thoughts, plots, and projects about it, a thousand to one, ordinarily seize upon your heart, with first and most acceptable entertainment at your first awakening, if it is not already broken off your sleep and troubled you in your dreams. Number 9. The cares, pleasures, and appurtenances of it are wont to thrust and throng upon you on the Lord's Day with extraordinary eagerness, importunity, and irresistibleness. For the devil, that desires to have your mind most distracted upon that day, makes choice of the fittest and most pleasing baits to draw away and detain your heart, and the most alluring objects for diversion. Number 10. In the darkness and discomforts of the night, if you are suddenly awakened with some dreadful thunder, lightning, or terrible tempest, the guilt and accusations of your beloved sin are wont to come into your mind in the first place and with greatest terror. Number three. A man may be deceived in conceiving that he is utterly divorced and quite delivered from his bosom sin, and yet it may be but a mere exchange or some other mistake. This gross, affected self-imposture may be seen in such cases as these. First, he may change only the outward and visible form of it. For example, whereas the same sin of covetousness does utter and express itself by usury, simony, sacrilege, bribery, grinding poor men's faces, crushing and unmerciful keeping under the poor of the same trade, stealing, overreaching by tricks of wit, all manner of wrongdoing, all kinds of oppression, detaining ill-gotten goods without restitution, and so on, he may insensibly glide out of one gulf of griping cruelty into another. He may fall from one of these, being a more notorious and cursed trait of hoarding, to some other of them less observed and odious in the world, and yet still abide in the chambers of death, and under the tyranny of a reigning sin." The foul sin of uncleanness does actuate itself by fornication, adultery, and other impurities. Now he may pass from one of these pollutions, more crying and abominable, to some other of them, not affrighting the conscience with such gristliness and horror, and yet still lie in the impenitent and damnable snares of lust. Secondly, he may cease and refrain from the outward gross acts of such hateful villainies, and yet his inward parts are still defiled with insatiable sensual hankerings after them, delightfully revolving them in his mind, 
in contemplative commission of them. For example, he may hold his hand both from the crying violence of oppressions and wrong, and the closer conveniences of cunning and fraud, and yet covetous may still reign in him by the earthly exercise of the heart. He may forbear the external acts of uncleanness, and yet lie and languish abominably in speculative wantonness, and adulteries of the thought, the visible executions of revenge, and yet nourish in his distempered affections, the hellish vipers of heart burning hatred and spite, all indirect ambitious climbing into high rooms, and yet be passingly proud and over-greedy of precedence. Thirdly, nay, he may every way change the kind of his bosom sin in respect of manner, form, object, and yet upon the manner it is but the exchange of one foul fin for another. For example, wantonness may be his sweet sin in youth, and worldliness in old age, reveling in his younger years, downright drunkenness in his declining time, prodigality may sway in some part of his life, pinching in some other. Hypocrisy may reign at one time, apostasy at another, furious ill for one while, profane irreligion for another. Fourthly, when the blasting frosts and feebleness of old age have, with a sottish deadness and listlessness, wasted the ambitious vigor of his mind and the boisterous heat of his affections have dried and drunk up the milk in his breasts and marrow in his bones, his darling sin may then at length bid him adieu, without any penitent discharge, and he may say to it, I have no more pleasure in you, whereupon he may falsely conclude a mortification and final conquest over it, a secure deliverance from the guilt and curse of it. Number five. He may unsoundly please himself with an involuntary and enforced cessation from it, when there is no want of good will, as they say, but only of matter, means, opportunity, enticement, company, provocation, or something for the full and free acting and enjoyment of it. So lack of money may restrain a man, but full sore against his will. From strange apparel, gaming, alehouse, haunting, buying of beneficence, offices, high places, and so on. Sixthly, he may for a time pull his neck out of the strongest yoke of Satan, only out of a melancholic pang of slavish terror, serious forethought of death, and lying everlastingly in hell, and true apprehension of the impossibility of being saved without abandoning it, upon some desperate horror of bringing again his beloved sin in his bosom to the communion, after so many causeful provocations of divine justice, observation of some remarkable vengeance seized upon his fellow delinquents, or sensible smart of some terrible blow from God's visiting hand in one kind or other. I say, upon some such occasion he may for a time forbear his vile oaths, usury, drunkenness, gaming, playhouse haunting, impurity, or whatever sin, soever does reign in him, and retain him strongest in the devil's slavery. But because it is not the work of the word, humbling him soundly under God's mighty hand, planting faith and infusing mortifying power. He is not able to hold out long, but the unclean spirit returns and rules in him again far more imperiously and sensually out of indignation of its discontinuance and proportionably to the party's new collective strength and eagerness to recommit it after his extraordinary and impatient forbearance. I know it is not impossible, but that a man after his conversion by the sudden surprisal of some violent temptation and cunning train of Satan, may be dragged back to commit his sweet sin again, especially it be of some nature, though it be a very heavy case, and to be lamented if it were possible with tears of blood. Yet he never does nor can return to wallow in it again or allow it. After such a dreadful relapse, his heart bleeds afresh with extraordinary bitterness of penitent remorse, he abhors himself in dust and ashes, is exceedingly vile, cries more mightily to God in a day of humiliation for the return of his reconciled countenance, repairs and fortifies a breach with stronger resolution, 
and more invincible watchfulness against future assaults and all attempts to re-enter. But the temporary professor I talk of, after his formal enforced forbearance, engulfs himself again with more greediness to the pleasures and sensuality of his bosom sin, lies and delights in it again as the very life of his life, and hardens himself more obstinately in it as a thing impossible to leave and live with any comfort. Upon his return, the unclean spirit rages more than before, Matthew twelve forty five. So, to lend you some light for a more fuller discovery and a thorough disentanglement out of its pleasing snares, I have intimated briefly what a beloved sin is, what yours may be, and how you may be deceived about it. For if you would truly taste how gracious and glorious the Lord is in a sweet communion with His blessed majesty, if you would be intimately acquainted with the mystery of Christ in which are hid infinite heavenly treasures, and such pleasures as eye has not seen, nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man, 1 Corinthians 2, nine. if you would ever be fitly qualified to walk humbly with your God in the way which is called holy, as you must fall out forever with all sin, so you must principally and impartially improve all your spiritual forces and aid from heaven, utterly to demolish and beat to the ground the devil's castle, to dethrone and depose from its hellish tyranny over you, that grand empoisoner of your soul, and the strongest bar to keep out grace and all acquaintance and sweetest intercourse with God, your bosom sin. Take notice, by the way, that since we concurrently and constantly teach that justifying faith does purify the heart from the rain and allowance of any lustful or evil course, and plants by the power of the Holy Ghost a sincere universal new obedience, and regular respect to all God's commandments, to all good works of justice, mercy, and truth, and that we neither do nor dare give any comfort to any man of his being justified and assured of God's love, who goes on impenitently in any one known sin, against his conscience, hating to be reformed, I say, since it is thus, take notice how unworthily and wrongfully the anti-Christian doctors, having received foreheads from the whore of Babylon, deal with us in this point. Hear them speak, so that their justification, meaning ours, says Fitzherbert, may according to their opinion stand with all wickedness. These words, says Orno, meaning of the French confession, are set down to assure the most wicked man that is, of the righteousness of the Son of God. Now the Lord rebuke you, Satan, who sit with such extreme malice and falsehood in the foul mouths of the popish proctors and rabshakas of Rome. They should with such prodigious lies and villainous slanders revile the Lord's champions and traduce the glorious heavenly truth of our most holy and righteous religion. But to my purpose, and to conclude the point, you must either with a resolute and everlasting divorce abandon and abominate your bosom sin, your darling delight to the pit of hell, whence it is formally received much enraged sensual poison, to the woeful wasting of your conscience, and the stronger and longer barring you from grace, or else you must continue an everlasting stranger from all communion and conversing with God. You shall never be able to meet him in his ordinances with true reverence and delight, or look him in the face with comfort at the last day. Scorn with an infinite and triumphant disdain to serve the mighty Lord of heaven and earth, servilely, slavishly, or formally, for selfish and private ends, or anything save his own sweet, gracious, glorious self. Hate hypocrisy from the very heart root, which foul Finn, painting himself more unobservedly in the warm sun, and shining prosperity of the gospel's flourishing estate with an outward guilt and superficial tincture does with greater variety and stronger imposture deceive both men's own souls and others in the glorious noontide of it. Nay, this great agent for the prince of darkness is so politic that he prevails too much many times in causing the decline in damp or profession and Christian zeal. For though at this day professors of the gracious way be in greatest disgrace with the most, and a drunkard, a swaggering good fellow, a usurer, a son or daughter of Belial, 
shall find more favor, applause, and approbation with the world than a man who makes conscience of his ways, so that it may seem the greatest madness to make profession of religion hypocritically. Yet even in these times there are some causes in which the devil takes occasion to cause some to play the hypocrite notoriously. Some there may be, who be in work and worthless, yet vainglorious and overgreedy of reputation, finding that they obtain no exception and applause with worldlings by reason of their worthlessness, and that natural men entertain them not with that estimation and account proportionable to their proud expectation, and conceiving also that, by their association and siding with the saints, who in preciousness of regard and dearness of love ever infinitely preferred the poorest Christian before the proudest Nimrod, they shall be prized above vulgar esteem and ordinary valuation, purposely put on a mask of outward conformity to the courses of Christianity, that by this they may procure and purchase some special credit and remarkable respect, and with some at least be accounted somebody in the world. Others there are, who seeing they cannot so easily and excessively satisfy and glut their greedy humors by their commerce, dealings, and mutual negotiations with natural men, for such are well able with equal cunning to countermine against their crafty and cozening underminings, their consciences will serve them to encounter and retaliate their unconscionableness with like overreaching retributions of circumvention and wrong. They can well enough sound and fathom with the crooked line of their own deceitful hearts the invincible depths of their Machiavellian projects and plots and knavery. I say others there are who upon such occasion that they may thrive in the world and grow in wealth more easily and unobservedly, put on a cloak of outward profession, and in policy only and hypocrisy draw towards a better side, mix and join themselves with God's children, hang upon and adhere to true Christians because they pitch upon them, make special choice of, and single out such upon purpose as those from whom by reason of the singleness and simplicity of their hearts the unsuspiciousness of their charity, the equity and conscionableness of their dealings in these cozening, supplanting, and undermining days, they may most fairly and easily suck out the greatest advantage and prey upon most plentifully with the devouring teeth of covetousness and craft, gilded over only with a veil of seeming and varnish of hypocrisy. A worthy divine sums up all I would say in this point thus, quote, Sometimes the fear of God's judgments as of the rack and of accusing conscience, of the torments of hell, fire, and so on, holds men in a slavish obedience, end quote. I fear there are too many abroad in the world, especially great ones, who by forbearance of other gross sins, to which their sensual affections are not so endeared, by outward performances of some holy duties, formal presence at religious exercises, or by countenancing and patronage of godly ministers and good men, hope to make amends, as it were, and to purchase protection and dispensation for the vengeance due to the sinful pleasures of some bosom and beloved lust in which they secretly lie. And therefore their outward conformity in other things is caused by fear of being horribly and remarkably plagued for that close darling delight. Others there are who by reason of respect to correspondence with, dependence upon, or gainful expectation from, some gracious great one, Christian friend, reverend pastor, patron, landlord, or governor, religious rich kindred, and so on, or other such by respects conform to the outward forms of religion and live reservedly under the canopy of a counterfeit profession. The false and hollow hearts of men many times harbor many private ends in their outward services of God, and howsoever they openly pretend religion, Yet they secretly intend and plot the satisfaction of their humor and serving of their own turns by an artificial and forced temporary taking part with the better part. Such servile professors as these ordinarily in the meantime stand at a stay in an external conformity to Christian courses. For no spiritual life warms their affections, no root of grace grows in their hearts. Formality of this kind is ever void of all vital vigor, vegetation and activity. Such men are constant only in a heartless, plodding course and coldness, and many times at length when the motive of their religious representations and shows is removed, 
and the encompass for which they counterfeited. They put off their visors and appear again plain carnal men and lewd fellows as they were before. A true convert, on the other hand, is so far from casting off his personal calling that after his calling to Christianity, he's more likely to discharge the duties thereof with far more care and conscience, though with a better mind, more moderate affections, and for a far more blessed end. But I should be endless in the discovery of this hidden and hellish gulf of hypocrisy in which thousands are swallowed up, even in this glorious midday of the gospel. For a man may as soon find out the way of an eagle in the air, the way of a serpent upon a rock, and the way of a ship in the midst of the sea is to track the cunning and crooked footsteps of this foul fin in the false hearts of Satan's followers. Only take notice that you can never possibly delight in God, nor ever comfortably come near him if you give any entertainment to it, in what form soever it represents itself, or whatsoever visor it offers to you, though ever so fairly vanished and gilded over with the devil's angelical glory. Build and erect all your resolutions and conclusions for heaven and God's service upon that strong and purest pillar, that main and most precious principle of Christianity, self-denial. Luke fourteen twenty six and 27. No walking with God. No sweet communion is sound. Peace, it is mercy seat, except for his sake. And keeping a good conscience, you are content to deny yourself, your worldly wisdom, natural wit, carnal reason, exception with the world, excellence of learning, favor of great ones, credit and applause with the most, your passions, profits, pleasures, preferment, nearest friends, ease, liberty, life, everything, anything, and fear no loss for all things else or nothing to the least comfortable glimpses of God's pleased face. Fourthly, exercise yourself continually and be excellent in that only heaven upon earth and sweetest sanctuary to a tried soul, the life of faith. Wish to live in some good measure is the duty and property of every living member of Christ Jesus. Love, therefore, and labor to live by the power of faith, which is the life of salvation, sanctification, and preservation. When you are languishing and trembling after a relapse into some old or a fall into some new sin, focus on scriptural verses like Luke 17.4, First Samuel 12.20, 1 John 1.9, 1 John 2.1. From this last place, a reverend divine collects this comfort quote. If we see our unworthiness, and with broken hearts acknowledge it, God is faithful and just to forgive it, be it ever so great, end quote. But this is a jewel fit only for the ear of a sincere Christian, when out of the fearfulness of his distrustful spirit, he puts off all comfort, though truly humbled, after ensnarement and some more specially affrighting sin. Let no swine trample upon it. If you are feeling spiritually deserted, Refresh and rest your sinking soul in the meantime until the Lord returns upon that sure rock. Blessed are all they that wait for him. Isaiah 30.18 Most blessed, dear and sweetest sanctuary. If the Christian die in that waiting state, he shall be certainly saved. For the Holy Ghost pronounces him blessed. In the deep and almost despairing apprehensions of your extreme vileness, and as it were nothingness and grace, by apprehending that most merciful promise from God's own mouth. Isaiah 43.25 In your perplexed and troubled thoughts about returning after backsliding, by the comfortable encouragements of Jeremiah 3, verse 1, Hosea 14, 1, 2, and 4, in your doubts of losing the love of God and life of grace, by your consideration of those passages in God's book where it appears that the love of God to his child in respect of tenderness and constancy, is infinitely dearer than that of a most loving mother to her little one. Isaiah 49.15 Stronger than the stony mountains and rocks of Flint. Isaiah 54.10 As constant as the courses of the sun and the moon and of the stars and of the day and of the night. In the hell storms of slanderous arrows and in poison darts of disgrace, Cleave to the most glorious promises, 1 Peter 4, 14, Matthew 5, 11. 
in the valley of the shadow of death by an assurance of God's merciful, omnipotent presence. Psalm 23, verse 4. Thus, in any trouble of soul, body, good name, outward state, present, or to come, you may, by the sovereign power of faith working upon the word, not only draw out the sting and expel the poison of it, but also create a great deal of comfort to your truly humble soul and maintain it in despite of all mortal or infernal opposition and a constant spiritual gladness. For all those promises in which your heavy heart in such cases may repose and refresh yourself, have their being from the blessed name of Jehovah, Exodus 6, 3. And therefore, are as sure as God himself, they are sealed with the bloody sufferings of his only Son, and therefore as true as truth itself. And if you be in Christ, are all as certainly yours as a heart in your body or blood that runs in your veins. Nay, and a little more for your comfort and glory of God's truth is mightily advanced and himself extraordinarily pleased by your more resolute, steadfast, and triumphant cleaving to them. What a blessed, sweet, and heavenly life, then, is a life of faith. A Treatise on Comfortably Walking with God, Robert Bolton, 1626.